بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم رب اشرح لي صدري ويسر لي أمري وحل العقدة من لساني يفقه قولي Hello Today we will learn about language Chapter 11 in your textbook Before we proceed let us see some basic definition of language, linguistic, and connection between linguistic and psychology. One-liner definition of language can be the system of communication we use to interact with each other in our everyday life. And uh, you can define it, language uh, is a system of communication using sounds or symbols that enables us to express our feelings, thoughts, ideas, and experiences. Language has four characteristics. It is symbolic. Words can represent the object, such as you think about, uh, you speak a word glass, and then you can realize it as well. It is semantic. It has meanings and it is generative. Very few symbols can be combined together to create several other expressions and messages. And it is stru structured, it has rules. And when we go towards linguistic, linguistics is the scientific study of language and it involves analyzing language form, its meanings, and the context in which it is spoken uh, or it is being used. You can say the context of the system. So linguistics actually try to traditionally analyze the human language uh, by observing an interplay between sound and meaning. Uh, about the universality of the language, uh, human cannot live without some sort of language. So it is as true as we say that we are social beings. Few things that you will also read in your uh, in your book and I am also giving some things, um, some points on this slide as well. It will make you believe that why we cannot live without language. Number one, humans are the only species to use complex language. We need to communicate because it is very important for our psychosocial well-being. We learn language more rapidly than another social skill. The speed at which language develops in the first year of life is extraordinary. Becoming proficient with spoken language is one of a child's most significant development milestone. People if left isolated without any language, they will develop their own language. Stages of language development in childhood are almost similar all over the world. And all languages, even significantly different from one another, they have words, expressions, syntax and rules that somehow are similar. So these are the few points and you can also read from your textbook as well. Uh, that make uh, language a kind of universal thing. Now, <clears throat> let's see components of language. There are four components of language. First is called phonology. It is the sound, sound, sound of a word. Like you say P-O-P, -P, pop. So P gives a sound. And then semantics, the meanings of the word and the whole sentence and then the syntax how you combine some words together to make a meaningful sentence and then the pragmatics how this this that sentence or um, words are used in our everyday life uh, how they become the part of our social language so these are the four components of language now uh, why we are studying language in cognitive psychology. 
uh, in next few slides you will find the relationship between mind and language okay uh, let's first see the physical connection between brain and language there are different parts in our brains that control the language or speech uh, in one of my lectures on 30th January this year, uh, you have learnt about parts of brain and their working. You have also studied about aphasia, the language impairment, uh, that we will revise here in brief. So any damage to any of the parts may result into language impairment. For example, in this slide, besides other parts, you can see Broca's area and Wernicke's area. They are involved in speech production and speech understanding respectively. If for some reason such as interruption in blood flow to brain uh, because of high blood pressure some, uh, uh, or some other reasons, uh, these parts of the brain get damaged. The patient will experience an aphasia, a kind of speech uh, disorder or language impairment. We have two kind of uh, aphasias and they, they are uh, actually named uh, following these uh, brain areas. So first one is expressive aphasia or we call it Broca's aphasia. Uh, a damage in Broca's area can result into expressive aphasia. In this connection, speech is effortful sound rather stifled with most utterances limited to four words or less function words such as prepositions and articles they are muddled or omitted uh, as you can uh, read this transcript uh, of a patient suffering from broca's aphasia uh, so you can also go to the link down there uh, to visit the web page where i have embedded these videos due to copyright uh, issues i could not embed these videos in my lecture here. However, you have also watched these videos in the classroom. Now uh, we will see about uh, the fluent aphasia. Any damage in Wernicke's area can result into fluent aphasia, also known as Wernicke's aphasia. In this condition, speech is effortless. Their speech may be fluent and grammatically correct, but tended to be incoherent answers may not match the questions. So the patient have a difficulty in understanding the written or spoken language. Uh, for example, you can also read the transcript of a patient who was suffering from fluent aphasia. Uh, to watch the video, video again, you can go through the link. So by now, with this information, I think uh, you have understood the connection between brain and language. I mean the physical connection. In next slides, uh, that is for your reading, uh, I am providing you a summarized information about these areas of brain. So you can just go through this slide uh, and read it. You can pause your video and you can read this slide uh, and then I will move further. Okay, I hope you pause the video and you uh, read that slide carefully. Now let us understand the relation between mind and language. Cognitive linguistics and psycholinguistics are two study areas that deal with the relationship between mind and language. I am presenting here two basic differences between these two study areas that will help you to understand uh, these domains in cognitive psychology. So first one is cognitive linguistic. Cognitive linguistics study how language reflects the working of the mind, such as how different words in different languages are perceived, for example, the color words. Whereas psycholinguistic study how the mind handles the working of language, for example, uh, how the different parts and areas in brain handle language. Cognitive language linguistics are they see language as a process of social interaction and memory process, whereas psycholinguistics see language as an independent function of brain. And they think 
and i think people with normal cognitive function may have limited language ability and even if they are experiencing a very normal process of social interaction and and vice versa well uh, now we will move towards the behavioristic perspective on language development the learning or behavioristic perspective argues that children imitate what they see and what they hear and that children learn from punishment or reinforcement or positive or negative reinforcement uh, this language the main theorist associated with the learning perspective is bf skinner and you have read about uh, bf skinner i think in one of the course you have read earlier skinner argued that adults shape the speech of the children by reinforcing the babbling of infants that sounds most like words and then children imitate repeat memorize the words before they go for a control drill and then with the reinforcement we make them learn the language bf skinner uh, is perhaps the best known behaviorist who who said that children are conditioned by their environment to respond to st certain stimuli and then they they learn the language when children speak the language of their parents they are rewarded and they become more skillful they grow in their ability to uh, respond in a manner that responds to the environmental stimuli given by his parents this shapes a child's language more than knowledge of rules psycholinguistics argued that behavioristic perspective on language learning uh, is not correct because it explained language learning with reference to the reinforcement and not an independent function of mind chomsky noam chomsky's criticism in this regard uh, proved a turning point towards psycho psycholinguistics the goal of psycho psycholinguistics is to discover the psychological process by which human acquire and process language there are four major concerns of psycholinguistics first is comprehension that is how to how do people understand spoken and written language and how do the people process different components of the language in their mind and second is speech production it is about the physical and mental process that helps people to create language third is representation and it is about how the different components of the language are represented to make a story or to have a conversation and the fourth one is acquisition it is about how do we learn language and not only our own language but also the foreign languages well now we will come towards the nativist theory uh, actually it is it is it is a theory of uh, the main person is a norm chomsky the nativist theory is a biologically based theory which argues that human are pre programmed with the innate ability to develop language norm chomsky as i mentioned earlier he was the main theorist uh behind uh, psycholinguistics uh, um, area study area on language development and uh he is considered as a nativist theorist chomsky defends that language is the product of an unlearned biologically based internal mental structure he reasoned that the rules which go on the proper uh Uh, use of language uh, are too complex that they cannot be acquired by the children in few short years because it should uh, take time but if we see that they are learning fast uh, as we have um, read earlier if they are learning fast then according to chomsky there must be something a kind of hardwired script over there so therefore some aspects of language must be innately specific meaning that these aspects of our language are not learned but they are already there in our biological heritage 
so all nativist theories of language development share certain elements such as certain grammatical concepts are common to all languages so they think that because of this evidence they can say we have a biological heritage of language and then uh, all nativists also uh, assume or they think that children are biologically predisposed to learn language and then all children come to the task of acquiring a language with a set of innate hypotheses which guide them to learn that language and also guide their attempts to abstract the principle which governs their language. Well, uh, Chomsky also proposed that children come equipped with an innate mental structure which makes the task of learning language feasible. He called this structure the language acquisition device, LAD. The LAD contains a set of features common to all languages called universal grammar and Chomsky also developed the concepts of transformational grammar, surface structure and deep structure. Transformational grammar is a grammar that transforms its sentence and surface structure are the words that are actually written and deep structure is the underlying message or meaning of a sentence. In this slide you can see uh, Chomsky theorized language learning. The children are provided access to the sample of natural language that activate the lad. Lad helps children to discover the structure of the language that they are going to learn. The innate knowledge of basic grammatical structure that is matched with the language they are learning and in this way the children develop language or children, children learn language. Well, I hope you remember Vygotsky and his famous zone of proximal development. Yes, uh, if you remember that, it will help you to understand interactionist view on language. Interactionists see children as having a strong biological predisposition to acquire language, just like nativist uh, has this, uh, pre um, this view. But interactionists are different there because they think that there is a strong social support, social interaction and the social context that actually helps this biological predisposition to work on. The main theorist associated with interactionist theory is Lev Vygotsky and he focuses on uh, the model of collaborative learning that he presented in his theory. And collaborative learning is the idea that conversations with older people can help children with both cognitively and linguistically. So we will uh, not go far uh, with it. Um, I think we have learned something about uh, the theories of language development. Now I will cut short here and I will take you some of the perception effects that we are used to experience in our daily conversation. I hope when you will read the text from the book, you will get more information. Uh, well, okay, you see a word uh, on the slide. So I am sure that you know what is this word. Even if you, you can't uh, uh, spell the whole word, but even then you know what is this word. Am I right? Yes, okay. And then in this slide, how do you see why you will circle this word from these four words? Because they have the same alphabets, but why you are circling this word? This word is giving meaning to you, but uh, it seems like the, from the four words, you are able to select one word and you are uh, recognizing this word very well. Well, this was a couple of small uh, tests. Now uh, I will go further. In next slide, you will see uh, some of the effects uh, that are easy to understand. And I hope you will not face any problem while reading that uh, from the book, even though you are welcome to ask any questions in our online class. In this slide, 
you are reading effects and then its description and then the conclusion. So the first effect is phonemic restoration. Phonemic restoration is a phenomena in spoken word, uh, in a spoken word in a sentence that can be perceived even if it is obscured by noise. For example, someone is saying a word but one or two alphabets in that word you could not hear due to some interruption or noise. But you readily perceive what is that word. For example, somebody saying the word gesture and somehow you could not hear the S sound in it because of noise. But you with your knowledge of the meaning may understand the whole word. So this effect is called phonemic restoration. Then there is another effect that is called words isolated from conversational speech. In this effect, it is difficult to perceive isolated words in a conversation. But as you know the context of the conversation, you are able to perceive the isolated words in the conversation context. And your contextual knowledge about any conversation, it helps you to perceive some of the words in the context of the conversation that were apparently isolated. And then we have speech segmentation. These are the individual words that are perceived in spoken sentences even though the speech stimulus usually does not indicate breaks between the words. But you are able to understand the different segments of the speech. So to say that you are listening a speech but the language of speech is fluent and sometimes you, you, you most likely miss the segments of the speech. But with your knowledge about the meanings of the words in the language and the context of that speech, you are able to understand the speech segments and even you can uh, uh, create the segments of the speech to make it meaningful. And it helps you to understand the speech. And the next effect is word superiority. This effect is about the phenomena that people can easily recognize letters presented within words as compared to the isolated letters. For example, uh, in one of the previous slides, uh, you find the word card among four words. So this effect is called word superiority. Well, I will advise you to read relevant text from the book but also read the word frequency effect. Um, now, let's have a brief look at the process of human, human communication. And that is very important uh, because language is all about communication. Whenever we are involved in some situation and, and we need to talk, we have some questions in our mind that inform us about the importance of communication. Such as, how did I handle the situation? Was I able to make my point understood? Did the discussion have a positive outcome? If not, why? What could, could I have done differently? People were hearing me or not? So there are some questions. And answer to these questions depend a lot on your communication skills. Communication includes written communication and talking to each other. We have non-verbal communication such as facial expressions, body language and gestures. We have visual communication, images and pictures, paintings, photographies, even the videos. And then we have electronic communication, telephonic calls, electronic mail like emails, cable television and satellite broadcasters. So in some of the communication, you have a two-way communication and in some of the communication, you have one-way communication. For example, if you are watching a TV, uh, so it is just broadcasting information to you. So it is a one-way communication. Human communication has several components. So we will begin with the context. The context is the setting in which communication takes place. For example, our personal conversation at a public uh, speech and then the climate. It is the feeling or the tone of the communication between two persons or even more persons. Then we have a source. Source 
is the person who is sending the message and that message goes through an encoding process of translating his message and uh, uh, into into a language that that other person can understand and then the message itself it could be a verbal message it could be a non verbal even a mental message like like telepathy and then the channel channel is the mean by which uh, you send send your message and then a the feedback loop feedback loop occurs when the sender invites a response to a message and then the receiver uh, listens that message and the receiver can understand that i have to respond so then a feedback loop occurs the receiver is the person who is receiving the message but he will decode the message uh, to learn and to understand what does it mean and then the interference may occur interference are uh, the the physical or psychological distractions that may cause some problems maybe some noise and in this picture you have you are watching an interference with light blue colors and then timing that can affect the communication process uh, so these are some of not some of these are actually several components of the communication process so let's see if animals can uh, can do communication yes of course animals do communicate with each other and there are several ways they communicate with each other for food for security for warnings to locate each other to find each other for example honey bees dance in specific patterns to inform other people uh, other members of the community uh, to find food elephants emit a very low pitch sound that that the human cannot hear and then they use this sound to call them the members of the herd and then the chimpanzees chimpanzees use facial, facial expressions and body language and they express their dominance their hatred or their feelings and affection to each other and then we have whales and dolphins they make vocal clicks and even they sing to exchange information about feeding migration and locating each other so communication is all around it is everywhere so i hope to to this lecture will help you to understand the language chapter of your book uh thank you very much again i am saying that please uh do have do read your textbook with this lecture i am also uploading a couple of um, uh, documents on ms team and lms for you uh, please have a look on those documents you will understand them very pretty well after this lecture thank you very much